This week on Arizona Illustrated, monsoon season brings rain, lightning, and an abundance of life. How photographs of a rare jaguar in southern Arizona spurred a debate over critical habitat and the effects of walls on wildlife. Hello, I'm Tom McNamara. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. This time of year on any given afternoon, the wind will pick up, the skies darken, and the clouds begin to rumble and crack with thunder. And then a dramatic and drenching downpour. The monsoon season is upon us. The storms are exciting and can be dangerous. They are life-giving to the Sonoran Desert. Its plants grow, bloom, and fruit, and some of Arizona's most remarkable creatures emerge. My name is Renee Lazat. I am a keeper at the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum in the Herpetology Department. The desert tortoise will become active during our monsoon season. And uh, this is also the season that we often will see some breeding behavior between the two sexes of the tortoises. So the males often approach the females and they initiate contact by bobbing their heads and touching noses. And uh, that's usually a, a tortoise hello, as it were. She'll lay her eggs within a few weeks of mating. And usually by the end of June, they're laying their eggs and then the baby tortoises will emerge at the end of the monsoon season. So right around the end of August, early September is when we're gonna start seeing those baby tortoises come up. They love grasses. Grasses is probably their number one food source. But then the, the annual plants would be the secondary food sources. And fortunately, those are very available by the end of monsoon. Baby tortoises are predated upon by a lot of different things, whether uh, small mammals will sometimes go after them, um, some of the larger birds like ravens or even thrashers might go after the baby tortoises. So it's a tough life. You gotta really blend in and stay out of trouble. Uh, my name is Howard Byrne and I'm uh, the invertebrate keeper here at the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum. The giant desert hairy scorpion is one that uh, is our largest scorpion of this region, and it's really closely associated as other animals with our rainy season, so it stays deep underground, kind of following the moisture line. As the rains come and start soaking things, it moves closer up to the surface, and by our summertime rains, when those are really in full force, by that time it's on the surface looking for a mate, looking for food, and doing its thing. The breeding cycle, that's a really fun story because that scorpion will actually, like many scorpions, the males will actually do a little dance for the females to court her, um, and then they will actually lay down a special object called a spermatophore, and then they'll grab claws with her, or pedipalps, and they'll try to drag her over top of that to complete mating. If the mating goes well, um, the female will actually give live birth. And in doing that, she will fold her legs underneath of her body, making what's called a birth basket. The little ones drop into the birth basket and then crawl up on mama's back, and she takes care of them for a while. So just her presence is a great way to deter predators from eating the little ones. They don't do much. You know, while they're on the mother's back, they don't eat. They don't do much of anything. In fact, if you were to shine an ultraviolet light on the babies, they would not fluoresce where the adults do until they molt that exoskeleton. Then they'll fluoresce underneath a UV light. Uh, and then at that point, after they've molted, they will leave mama's back, disperse, and go on and hunt on their own. Hey, my name is Sandy Wright, and I work for Pima County Natural Resources, Parks and Recreation, and I'm an environmental educator. Some of the things we might see out and about are millipedes. After a good rain event, usually early in the morning, we see them. 
Uh, millipedes are arthropods. They have a, a hard exoskeleton, similar to insects and other similar species. Um, and like some other species of insects and arthropods, they lay eggs, but they don't take care of those eggs. They lay the eggs and then move on, and when the little babies hatch, they're pretty much on their own and can survive on their own. Although, although probably most of them don't survive. They're preyed upon by other species. Millipedes are harmless. They're a great little uh, creature to watch during the monsoon, and so there's, there's no reason to fear them. You probably don't want to touch them just like you don't want to touch other types of wildlife. Watch from a distance is a good policy. And they are uh, vegetarians, unlike the centipedes that are carnivores, and sometimes people confuse those two. The giant desert centipede is probably, to me, one of our most exciting animals. It has great warning coloration. Um, it's a very willing and engaging predator. No hesitation. Sometimes tarantulas and other things can be a little hesitant about accepting prey, but the giant desert centipede is willing to engage, and it will eat almost anything it can overpower. Uh, its breeding cycle is tied closely to that rainy season. It's another one of those animals that stays deep underground. They're going to wait for that moisture to reach closer to the surface. Um, when they are ready, uh, the male and female will mate. Um, if that all goes well, she will lay eggs, about a dozen or 20 eggs, uh, little yellow eggs in a ball. And she will wrap around them and rest her head like some snakes will do right on top and protect those eggs. She'll groom them and take care of them. Uh, when they hatch, they turn into little nymphs. Um, at that point, she'll stick around just a little longer, and then they all disperse and go their own way. The vinegaroon, or the whip scorpion, is probably, maybe by some people's standards, the ugliest and most awful, intimidating looking creature uh, we have. The good news is it's not really around here where saguaros grow, but if you move down into dry grassland areas, uh, right about where the oak line starts, again, during that rainy season, that's when you're going to come up, that's when we're going to see them. Um, that's when you might, if you're lucky, uh, on a nice rainy, cool night, run into the vinegaroon. Instead of using a stinger or any kind of venom, it doesn't have any of those. But what it does is it can squirt vinegar at whatever's bothering it. So about 85% vinegar, just enough to irritate the eyes and the mucous membranes right into the eyes, mouth, or nose of something that's bothering it, is usually enough to have a smell and a taste that can change a predator's mind about whether that animal is on the menu. The vinegaroons are going to be mating during that rainy season. The male is going to court with the female and mate with her, then he's going to leave and have nothing to do with the situation anymore. When mom has eggs, they're going to be attached to her abdomen. Uh, when those hatch, much like the scorpion story, they're going to crawl up under her back, and then at some point over the next few weeks, they're going to disperse and go about their business finding food. My name is John Weens. I'm nursery horticulturist at the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum. I'm in the Department of Botany. The monsoon means a whole lot for the plants and everything that's associated with these plants. Um, of course, nothing lives out here in a vacuum. The plants are here because there's pollinators, and the pollinators are here because there's plants. And when the plants bloom, the pollinators thrive. The pollinators start to reproduce. The plants are reproducing, and it's just a wonderful time of the year. And the monsoon is a great time to see butterflies, many different species in Arizona. Some of them are migratory, some are ones that just barely make it up into southern Arizona. There's local resident butterflies, the birds, all kinds of little critters out there in the desert. The monsoon is a great time of year to get out there and do some wildlife watching because many of these species, that's the only time we may see them active. However, be careful when you're out there, especially near thunderstorms. You want to be careful and uh, not go outdoors during those times, but otherwise get out there and enjoy our Arizona wildlife.
In the mid-1800s, jaguars could be found throughout South and Central America, along the coast in the western mountains of Mexico, into the southwestern United States, and as far north as the Grand Canyon. But by 1990, jaguars were thought to have been eliminated from the United States. That changed in 1996, when two different male jaguars were photographed in southwestern New Mexico and Arizona. These photographs, and an effort to save these rare cats, ignited an ongoing debate over critical habitat for the jaguar and its effect on the people making a living there. All wild cats are very important to ecosystem functioning because they are, they are apex predators. They are the top of the food chain. People might be familiar with the tiger and the lion in, in the, the old world, but in the Western Hemisphere, the jaguar is the only truly large cat. Though the jaguar is an endangered species, the northernmost extent of its range is here in southern Arizona and the boot hill of New Mexico. I uh, have had over the last 15 or so years, I think we've had four to five different males. As a biologist, I have always been fascinated by the cats for my entire career. We actually have cameras in 16 mountain ranges across uh, the southern half of, of Arizona and New Mexico. The project is designed to, to survey and monitor for jaguars and, and ocelots throughout this landscape. They're a very secretive and cryptic animal. They have those spots because they hide well, and it helps them hide well. They avoid humans, and therefore we don't see them very often. Well, we only have the one known male jaguar in the Santa Ritas, probably from a source population in Mexico. These individual males will go from one mountain range to another, to another, and may spend possibly even several years in what we call that transient phase. But that facilitates gene flow across the landscape. Because of its unique location between the Chihuahuan and Sonoran and Mojave deserts, along with the Sky Island ecosystems that we have here with these tall mountain ranges and low desert valleys, it really provides for a wide range of habitats which encourages a really abundant biodiversity. So that's one of the really unique things that's going on here in the southeastern Arizona Skylands region. Another thing is, um, you know, these are pretty productive ecosystems, so they provide uh, things like forage for cattle ranching, but also for wildlife so we can support um, large populations of undulate species, for example. The important thing for us was to stay involved in the process and make sure that we knew when the cameras were being checked, make sure we can adjust our management, if there's a way we could adjust our management to put us at less risk. It's kind of difficult when you're dealing with a predator that can cover vast swaths of, of area. Whether it's the Mexican wolf or the spotted owl or now the jaguar, uh, people are very polarized in some of these issues. I think residents of rural areas are very much fearful of regulation. And while I know there's a need for regulation, a lot of times there's just too much regulation out there and it prevents us from doing the types of things that we need to do to maintain these open spaces. This is the time I came down and spoke for the first time to the Malpai and said, we'll do critical habitat over my dead body. I'm still alive although this meeting isn't over yet. Um, 2006, we got sued again. Uh, the court did not agree with us. Didn't have a lot of choice at that point. The judge said, you will reassess whether critical habitat is prudent. And given the unambiguous wording of his order, uh, we felt we had no choice but to say, yes, sir, it's prudent. We will proceed. I believe the U.S. Fish and Wildlife is correct. I believe this should never have been critical habitat because it's not critical habitat. It's, it, it's not. 
So Jaguar Critical Habitat's been designated um, from the Babakivri Mountains to um, the San Luis Mountains in southern New Mexico. And that includes the Babakivri Mountains, the Santa Rita Mountains, and uh, the Huachucas, um, the Whetstones, and the Canelo Hills, and then out towards the, the San Luis Mountains in New Mexico. So it's a pretty broad range of area that's been designated critical habitat. Well, critical habitat is only applicable to federal actions. So if you're a permittee on a federal land like the Forest Service, the federal agency has to consider the effects of issuing that grazing permit on the species at hand. The concern from the rancher's point of view, and I, I think it has to do with historical interactions they've had with endangered species, I think it has to do with the general idea that when people have lines drawn around their property or their grazing allotments, why is that line there? That generally indicates that something on one side of the line is different than it is on the other side of the line. So I can see that concern. The critical habitat designations are on the ranches. They are where the ranches are. That's where the open space is. That's where the unfragmented areas are. And you know, this is just one of those types of regulation that, that uh, I feel is kind of just forced on us. Uh, uh, through litigation, basically. Uh, in that talk, I went through the list of features that we believe are essential to jaguars. Those are things like rugged topography, distance to water, uh, vegetative cover, uh, canopy cover, I should say. None of those are really influenced by grazing, so we don't see a concern. We are, uh, we are hoping that that is the case, but we will be watching out. They, they do have a lack of confidence in the system. I think the, the court case that compelled us to, to designate critical habitat is, is fresh in their minds. Um, but I think this is a much different case. We evaluate actions all the time that have adverse effects on critical habitat. But only if it gets to be so egregious that the if action is going to drive the species unacceptably toward extinction would it be prohibited under the Endangered Species Act? A lot of people don't understand that. Within what I think is a relatively short amount of time, people will realize that critical habitat is not having any effect on their day-to-day -day lives. The ranch lands provide ecosystem benefits to the rest of us who live in urban areas or even in small towns in that, you know, providing open space, which again is probably for wildlife the most critical thing, keeping these wildlife populations healthy and intact. Uh, development and sprawl and subdivisions and infrastructure is the greatest threat that we have to, to wildlife and especially a large wide-ranging species like the jaguar. And this, the same holds true for the mountain lion and the bear and even, even, even deer to some degree, is that these animals that need large landscapes need intact open landscapes. Keeping these ranches intact is, again, the best thing we can do. Illegal immigration has been a contentious political topic for decades, with controversial ideas and policies on how to curb the flow of people entering the United States illegally. According to a recent NPR story, the federal government has spent $2.3 billion to build 649 miles of steel fencing in sections between the U.S. and Mexico. It's called tactical infrastructure, and supporters say it works. But those barriers can have unintended consequences. The San Pedro River is a verdant oasis in a sea of mostly desert brown. It's a resplendent ribbon of life that meanders through mountains and valleys, providing habitat and sustenance for hundreds of species that are dependent on life-giving water. Yeah, I can hear the yellow warblers right ahead of me here. Robert Weisler is with Friends of the San Pedro River, a nonprofit organization that works to protect the region. He says this environment is a place for reflection, exploration, and education and the familiar sound of the Gila woodpecker. Omnipresent, really. 
Weiser says the San Pedro Riparian National Conservation Area also reminds him of another unique environment halfway around the world. He visited Egypt years ago. Of course, you see this broad, expansive desert, sandy desert. I mean, really without any vegetation at all, not like here. So in the middle of that desert expanse was this green ribbon, and it was the Nile. It is the Nile. So to me, this is kind of the miracle of southern Arizona. This is where you find migratory and breeding birds in high concentration because it has so much to offer. However, the future of this ecosystem is uncertain. Some researchers say pumping groundwater for growing human populations poses a threat to the river, while man-made projects to control illegal immigration and drug trafficking, they add, are damaging natural areas and disrupting animal populations. The San Pedro straddles two countries. It begins in Sonora, Mexico, and travels north to Arizona. Formerly flowing freely, the rivershed is now obstructed by fences or other structures. The barriers are designed to keep people, drugs, and vehicles from crossing into the United States from Mexico. It's blocking the animals, but it's not stopping people from crossing. Dan Millis works for the Sierra Club's Borderlands campaign, which opposes these barriers. We have seen ocelot, we've seen jaguar here. If a large mammal comes upon this wall, Unless it's a monkey, there's no way it's getting over it. You can't get through this. There are smaller holes in the wall where there are low water crossings. Small animals can get through. But uh, anything wider than four inches, out of luck. Aaron Flesh conducts studies on wildlife populations as a research scientist with the University of Arizona School of Natural Resources and the Environment. Flesh says barriers, roads, and other man-made projects can have various detrimental impacts on nature, including these. Traditional migration patterns can be altered or stopped in some places. Habitats are divided and fragmented, separating historic environments and populations. And connectivity can be reduced or even halted. For example, Flesh says animals from one area may no longer be able to recolonize vacant habitats where the numbers of other members of their species have plunged or gone extinct locally due to random events such as disease. The inability to move or recolonize can lead to declines in populations, a reduction in their genetic diversity and health, and even possible extinctions over the long term. Metropolitan Tucson serves as an illustration of the challenges faced by animals. So behind me is Mount Lemmon in the Catalina Mountains, and to the south is the Santa Ritas, which is essentially the next closest available habitat patch to the south. And a black bear trying to move from Mount Lemmon down to the Santa Ritas is going to have a pretty tough time getting through the city at the base of the Catalinas there. And a border wall can act very much in the same way by preventing movement between populations. John Ladd is a rancher next to the San Pedro River whose relatives have been working on this land since the late 1800s. Arizona was not a state back then, and the family's cattle had a wider range where they could roam, stretching into what is now Sonora, Mexico. Great-grandparents homesteaded in 1896, and back then they went all the way to the mountain. That's the San Jose Mountain. That's, that's what the ranch is named after. In the past few decades, however, his daily ranch work has changed significantly. I spend about 50% of my time fixing fence or dealing with something that's broken, somebody tore it up. Um, before this immigration deal, we had fences that were 60 years old that were perfectly good. And, you know, this fence is eight years old and it's about shot. Ladd believes the walls are effective if they are patrolled by agents at the ready when breaches occur. Yet he also has personal knowledge of the barrier's failings with regards to wildlife. We had a really nice herd of mule deer that migrated in from Mexico every October, stay here till February. Probably have 200, 250 deer. And I probably got 40 deer left because they finished the wall in the October. They can't get across that. Nothing can get through that thing. Uh, birds can fly over it, but it, it's terrible. But people who are intent on entering illegally have their ways. They have a chop saw, gas-powered chop saw, carbide blade, and they just cut everything. It takes 10, 15 minutes. 
And, it, you know, it's a, a whole crew of people doing it, and it's staged, and they're ready to go. State Representative Steve Smith says additional barriers and enforcement are needed to reduce unauthorized migration and the drug trade. Smith says there's already an example in Arizona where both approaches, walls and patrols, are working. Yuma, the Yuma sector, now what do we do there? Sent the National Guard out, built a double layer border fence, put proper law enforcement on the other side of the border to actually detain and arrest when illegal activity came over, had a swift judicial system in place to quickly expedite and either deport or imprison, whatever the case was. 95% of the illegal activity along that Yuma sector has stopped. And that's not Steve Smith saying it, that's, that's Yuma County saying it, that's Yuma law enforcement. Smith acknowledges these efforts could affect animals and plants along the border, but he says that should not stop the construction projects wherever feasible. Protecting our country and our citizens is the number one priority. But again, my oath of office is to the American people, not to, a, not to an animal species. And the U.S. Border Patrol says the jury is still out on the barrier's impact on wildlife. Here's part of a statement the agency is providing, quote, the Tucson Sector Border Patrol uses two distinctive types of fencing, vehicle and pedestrian. Vehicle barrier fencing does not limit the movement of wildlife. Pedestrian fencing is used in urban areas where wildlife movement is not a significant consideration. Customs and Border Protection is not aware of any studies or data which support a conclusion that the border fence has resulted in any measurable impact on wildlife movement. Clearly, illegal immigration and the social and economic background and drivers behind it are much more complex than just the environmental effects of border infrastructure. But I think those problems are solvable, and I think if we put together multidisciplinary teams of folks and stakeholders together with the government, not just our government, but the Mexican government as well, that we can solve these problems. It's a question of what we value. And uh, nature is something fragile we shouldn't take for granted. And so these special resources have to have the ability to move in order to thrive. That's a values question. You know, I'm a scientist. I'm not really here to answer values questions necessarily. Um, I can tell you from my own personal viewpoint, and that is native animals have a right to persist for their own sake, especially because they were here before us. Thank you so much for watching Arizona Illustrated. Next week, what do some students from the U of A, ancient pots from Northern Arizona, a trauma care unit, and Drosophila, Homopterus, Greyhawks, frogs, and a whole lot of moths have in common? Sci View, of course. I'm Tom McNamara. See you next week.